So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Martin Landau. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. What a nice divergent group. Yeah, yeah. Got a full house tonight. Um, well, let's, let's begin at the beginning, right? Sure, that's the way it goes here. You were uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, Brooklyn New, York. New York. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Flatbush. <laughs> Funny name. Yeah. Yeah, when I was 17, I uh, got a job on the New York Daily News as, as a cartoonist. Illustrator, I lied about my age. I said it was 18, oh. and I was still in high school. And I do my homework on the train. I would leave uh, Brooklyn at three o'clock and arrive at the news building at four and work till midnight. Huh. And then I'd go back to Brooklyn doing my homework. Uh -huh. I'd be at high school again at eight in the morning. What so. kind of cartoons were they? Was I it a strip a, or a... Billy Rose did a column called Pitching Horseshoes, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I did the cartoon that went along with it. And then there was a cartoonist called uh, Gus Edson who did a comic strip called The Gumps, which is a popular strip, uh -huh. actually. Uh -huh. And I was his assistant, and I did uh, all kinds of things. And uh, I, I was actually being groomed as a theatrical caricaturist because a fellow uh, who was doing that, a fellow called Horace Knight, was uh, well into his 70s. And uh, so I, I would occasionally uh, do some caricatures uh -huh. of uh, you know, people in the theater. I started in the theater as well. So, uh -huh. so do, do you, uh, have you ever shown the, that collection of, uh, of comics? Uh, back I, then? I came across some of them uh, within recent times. I know I don't show them. I, yeah. I, Do you still uh, like to dabble well, a little bit? Because well, I went to Pratt Institute and, and majored in fine arts too and I paint as uh -huh. well and I, I sort of dabble a little of that but uh -huh. no I, I you know I, I also take photographs that are kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, even my family photographs uh, <laughs> over the years were uh, you know I, I would shoot periodically and, and uh, no I, I, I don't do that. No, no. I, no, mainly because I feel people make a living doing that who need to do that, and I do what I do. No, oh. yes. nevertheless, we'd like to see them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a market out there just the same. So after, uh, w when did you first uh, get into uh, acting? What what brought well, you into well, it? What it was very strange. I looked around uh, me at the news building and I saw. A lot of people who were 30 and 40 years my senior doing what I was doing, and I realized the kind of painting and drawing I liked doing, I did at home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess it was fomenting in me, but one day I, I just got up and walked over to a fellow called Bill White and said, can I leave now or do I have to give you notice? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he looked at me. He was a man who virtually had no neck. <laughs> and, 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 and he was in a swivel chair, and, and he s would swivel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and he said, uh, what are you talking about? I said, I, I, I want to go into the theater. I think he thought I had a job as an usher. Ah, uh, yeah. But, but I, 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 he said, you can't just walk out. I said, what do I have to do? He said, you have to give us two weeks' notice, fill out. Uh, so I said, OK. <laughs> and two weeks later, I left. Uh, a lot of people. Because it, it, it must have seemed impulsive, but it mm. was obviously uh, brewing in me for a while. Yeah. And uh, I then left and went away to summer stock. I, I auditioned uh, for uh, the Peaks Island Playhouse uh, uh, and, and became part of a resident company there. Mm -hmm. We had a company of 40 people. Uh, Peaks Island was an island about two miles outside of Portland, Maine. and uh, it was billed as America's first summer theater. It was started at the turn of the century. Yeah. And uh, we, had, uh, we did a straight play, a musical, a straight play, a musical, all summer. We did 12 shows in 13 weeks. Uh, everything from Streetcar Named wow. Desire to uh, Roberta 
to Where's Charlie, to all, all kinds of things. And I found myself singing and dancing. And, and uh, after that summer, I, I uh, went back to New York and uh, went, you know, started to study, mm -hmm. <laughs> figuring out better. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you uh, first wind up studying? Where did you first go? Well, I, 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 there was a fellow, kind of a, Kurt Conway was, a, was a, one of the baby, babies of the Groove Theater. Mm -hmm. He and Martin Ritt and a number of mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was, uh, had been a, one of the younger, young directors at, at CBS during the early live television days. Mm -hmm. And uh, he w was married to a young actress called Kim Stanley. Mm -hmm. And Kurt actually broke in people like Marty Ritt and Bob Mulligan and uh, Sidney Lumet and people like that. And then Kurt signed uh, a couple of petitions and a couple of papers and found himself blacklisted. Mm -hmm. uh, just bingo. I mean, he had never been a communist, but he, the, one of the things he signed was a Willie McGee petition, which is a, uh, a young black fellow who was accused, wrongly accused, of raping a white woman in the South. And, and there were these petitions that went around to try and get him a fair trial. And a lot of the organizations that sponsored these uh, petitions were rather radically left-wing organizations. So if you signed the petition for the cause, you, you were suddenly identified with the organization. Anyway, he found himself blacklisted. And, and then Kim, who was a, a, a virtually an unknown actress, became, uh, she was in Picnic, and then, uh, so she became a Broadway star and he couldn't work. And uh, what became sort of a, Hell for Kurt uh, was a, an odd blessing for me because he became a teacher and my first teacher of, of significance and a wonderful teacher. And uh, uh, so I, I started working with, with Kurt and then with others and then I auditioned for the actor studio. Tell us about that and, process. Uh, because well, that I, was... I, I, I was very fortunate. I, I, I did a scene. I read a lot of scenes in this, you know, there was a, a, a play called Middle of the Night, uh, no, I beg your pardon, Clash by Night. Middle of the Night is a play that I was in later. Hmm. Uh, Clash by Night was a play that uh, Clifford Odets had written for the group theater. And the group theater broke up. And they decided to do it in the commercial theater. Uh, so Lee Strasberg, it was the first play done after the group theater uh, disbanded. The group theater had been in existence from 1931 to 1941, and suddenly Odets had be was an actor who had become a very important writer, and, and the group theater, of course, uh, brought the Stanislavski system as we know it to the United States. And, uh, certain kind of ensemble acting and plays like Golden Boy and Rocket to the Moon and <coughs> Waiting for Lefty and so on were uh, plays that uh, brought playwrights like Clifford Odets and Erwin Shaw and others, uh, Sidney Kingsley, to America's consciousness. Uh, well, Lee Strasberg, who was one of the three people who ran the group theater, Howard Clerman, Lee Strasberg, and Cheryl Crawford created the group theater. And out of that, of course, people like Sanford Meisner and uh, Martin Koronofsky, and, but a lot of teachers, Stella Adler, of course, and uh, a lot of Lee J. Cobb, we, John Garfield, Francis Tone, a lot of you know, <coughs> fairly well-known people emerged. And many, some became movie stars, some worked back and forth theater, Hollywood, and so on. Well, Lee Strasberg directed Clash by Night as um, a play in the commercial Broadway theater with Lee J. Cobb, Tallulah Bankhead, and Joseph Schilkraut in the mm. three major roles. Mm. 
And it was, a, it, it, again, it was Clifford Odets's entree to the commercial theater. When I say commercial, of course, you know, the group theater plays were done commercially, but they were under the umbrella of the group theater, and this was out there in the world. Hmm. At any rate, everyone said, you're not going to do a scene from Clash by night. Bless you. <laughs> you're not going to do that, are you? I, I said, what, what are you talking about? They said, well, you know, Lee Strasberg directed it on Broadway. And, and the final auditions at that time were, you, you, there were three judges. If you passed the preliminary audition, you did a final. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> excuse me, Lee Strasberg, Aaliyah Kazan, and Cheryl Crawford were the judges. And you had to get three one votes. The voting still exists in the same way. One means yes, two means mm -hmm, come back, uh, and three means no, but come back a year from now, work. But you had to get three one votes to get in. And they said, the old man, Strasbourg, not that he was that old, I look back now. <laughs> well, we called him an old man. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know why. <laughs> Some people are just born old, I think. Well, you know, he, they're, they're, he you sort know. of was. Yeah. Yeah. But as I look at it now, he was a young fellow. <laughs> at any rate, uh, they say he'll never pass you, no matter what you do, he'll never agree with you. I mean, he's, you know, I mean, he, he's so close to that play, he and Clifford, and, you know. And I started listening to people, and I started doubting my, my selection. And then I woke up in the middle of the night and said, what the hell am I doing? I, 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 if I, it's a five minute scene with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a guy who's a drifter waking up with a hangover. It's got all this stuff. It's very passionate. If I can't do this scene, I don't deserve to be in the actor's studio. And I did it, and I passed. And uh, that year, uh, many thousands of people auditioned, and Steve McQueen and I were the only two who were accepted that year. So, uh, and, and Lee was very much kinder to Steve than he was to me, I must say. <laughs> uh, because, I, I mean, he, he beat the hell out of me. He really did. I mean, uh, you know, I used to say, friends like that, you don't need enemies. <laughs> but uh, it was good for me because it, it, uh, he was kinder to Steve because he had been a little rough on Jimmy Dean and uh, Jimmy stopped working at the studio. So I think he, he said, well, maybe they're similar. Uh, better go easier on the, the kid. Uh, at any rate, uh, I got into the actor's studio. Boy, that's a long, long. That's okay. No, that's that's exactly where we wanted to go. So. Long answer. <laughs> what was the curriculum like? I mean, when, when well, you were there. A, I mean, it's not a school. No, I know that, but I mean. Well, I mean, well, we did a lot of sense memory work. We did a lot of emotional work. I, 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 I was always trying things. I mean, I, I remember I adapted uh, a s scenes from the Brave Bulls, uh -huh. uh, which I played at Tor Torero, and I, I. I I adapted an O. Henry uh, short story called The Port, uh -huh. in which a man, uh, a sailor, goes on leave in, in Marseille and picks up a, a prostitute and winds up uh, with a terrible hangover in the morning uh -huh. uh, with this whore and, and, and finds out it's his sister. Ooh. Uh, yeah. I mean, it would I, I, I always chose things with these huge emotional moments. Uh, because I, mean, I, I, I felt that, you know, that, that the theater needed that kind of thing. I mean, and, and you know, he, he's conversing with her, having awakened and, and, and had a, you know, filthy place. Uh, and, and then he starts talking to her as he's dressing, and, and, and he finds out she comes from the same town, and you know, and then, and he, so that, uh, the, I did things like that at the studio. Uh, did, how uh, often did you have classes there? I mean, was it daily? Well, I mean, was it was, it a couple it was, times a week? A couple or? of times a week, yeah. yeah. And, and did you hold down a job during that time, a straight uh, job as well, or, or did no, you have to? No, what I did was, uh, I had saved money up from when I was, you know, at the news, and then I was uh, doing small parts on television. Great. Uh, 
you know, it was live days and I would do uh, small parts in Danger and Suspense and Studio One and mm -hmm. nothing. And then I, I, I got a, a, I, Omnibus was a live show and I did, uh, uh, they did all kinds of interesting things on Omnibus, it was called an artistic show. And uh, I, I played John the Baptist in Oscar Wilde's Salome mm -hmm. with uh, Patricia Neal playing Herodias, Leo Ginn playing Herod Salminio playing mm -hmm. the page to Herodias, uh, Eartha Kitt as oh, nice. uh, Salome. Oh, wow. And uh, John Stix, who, who was a director the, uh, from the studio, uh, uh, directed that. Uh, so I, I get parts here and there, yeah. enough to right. kind of tide me over. Uh -huh. And then in the summer I go away to stock or go on tour with uh -huh. something. Uh -huh. So I managed to stay afloat, uh, barely, just barely. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't. A, you weren't rolling in dough at that no, point. No, I wasn't rolling in parts either, yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. But I was really, I, I, it's funny because I, I would read for a lot of things. I'd, Johnny Cassavetes and Sidney Pollack and Mike Tolan and, and Paul Stevens and I, I'd always see the same guys yeah. in, in the outer offices. Uh, we were all reading and one of us would get it probably mm -hmm. and we'd never know which ones and it was high, high, high and, <laughs> and, and we've all been through those experiences. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it, and then there were the open CBS casting calls too. At the, they had taken over some Broadway theaters, used them for television theaters, and uh, once a week they would uh, sort of have a cattle call and you'd go in. I used to go when it was rainy because it was a great place to see your friends. <laughs> and, and, uh, get out of the rain. And, and you'd, they'd call you ten, 10 at a time. You'd get numbers and you know, you'd go up and if you were, at all right for something, you get a chance to read for an under five line part. They used to delineate it, sometimes a better part than that. But uh, I, I never was very successful at that. Now, th was this for virtually all the shows that were this on CBS? This was for all CBS's shows. They wow. decided to open it up for the actors uh, who they didn't know. Yeah. They were the same people doing the parts every week, practically. Right. Right. Uh, you had John Barragray and John Newland and Maria Reaver and Mary Sinclair. I mean, uh, it was almost, they were almost like a test pattern. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, so, they, uh, so they kind of opened, tried to open it up, but not a lot of people were <laughs> selected in that system. And it was a bit, a bit humiliating, really, you know, ten at a time standing up there, you felt like you were facing a, a firing up. squad. <laughs> you know. Are you going to hire me or shoot me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so how long did you stay at the uh, Actors Studio in well, that I'm first still, go? I know, I know you're still involved, but I mean, yeah. in that first go around, where well, you, no, a you don't years, leave. You never really left. I never left. Yeah. The man who came to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, yeah. I actually uh, run the West Coast Actors Studio with Mark Rydell and Sidney Pollack. Right. Uh, Sidney's less active these days, but Mark and I are still very active. And uh, I helped start the the West Coast, West Coast studio because Lee Strasberg felt it would never work out here. Uh -huh. And we did it without his blessing. And then uh, about a year and a half to two years after we began the West Coast studio, uh, he would spend six months here and six months in New York. So mm -hmm. he did give it credence and, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's still going and... Uh, going quite well. It's going well. and, yeah. and uh, yeah, and anyone can audition for the well, actor's studio. I was just going to ask, what's the audition process like you now? You pick a five-minute scene with a partner, uh, obviously choose something close to you that you identify with and connect to. If you pass that, you do a final audition. If you pass that, you're a life member. You never have to pay a nickel. It's a great deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know why more people don't audition. Uh, it's a chance. We just elected uh, to run the New York studio. Uh, three people you might know of: uh, Al Pacino, Harvey Keitel, and Ellen Burstyn. And and and, and uh, 
it, it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm going to be moderating the sessions out here again in September for the first time in a long time because I haven't been able to. Uh, Estelle Parsons has been moderating the sessions on, on the East Coast along with Lee Grant. And it's one studio, so I mean, if you're here, you can come here. If you're there, you go there. Mm -hmm. And it's a great place to work. And it's a laboratory. It's a place to keep yourself tooled up. Uh, you know, I mean, I was living in England for uh, a number of years doing a series there. And when the actors there get out of RADA or drama school, they, they'll go into rep for a while usually, and then, but they, ne they never go back to the laboratories and the places. And, and American actors do more, much more readily, and I think it's good that we do. Uh, between jobs, it's great to have a place like that where you can go and, you know, I mean, I was doing things like King Lear when I was in my 20s. And <laughs> not that I would play him, uh, but the challenge, you know, the chance to do th stuff like that or... Uh, it's just, you know, again, and, and, and I'm still active mainly. It's like paying my dues. It was very good to me. It, it was an oasis for me. I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of money, and, and it was a wonderful place to study. And it, it's terrific that a place, you know, that the studio has been in existence since 1947. Just think about it. And a, a group of actors that have stayed together for that length of time is a miracle. <laughs> for sure. It's like SAG. I mean, you know, this is a, it, this is great. Uh, I mean, this, the acting community, organizations that are run by actors, about actors, for actors. Uh, there should be more of the, this sort of thing. And, I mean, you realize, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I came here in the 50s, but prior to that, I mean, before SAG, you know, they worked a six-hour day. There were no time constraints. I mean, it, it, was, it was really terrible when, when, when the Screen Actors Guild was started. It was really a necessity because it was like slave labor. And uh, we've grown into a very strong, powerful, wonderful union. Anyway, no more proselytizing. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We needed that little commercial in here anyway. Um, what, what would you look back on and say was sort of the turning point for you? When you're back in New York, you're at the oh. actor's studio, you're getting bit parts here and there, but then suddenly something happens. Well, was there a breakthrough role for you? Something. Well, happened? it was. I mean, I did a. Th there were a lot of things. I mean, I, I, there was never one thing. I mean, mm -hmm. at, at early on, I did. I did. I did. Padachevsky's play "Middle of the Night" on Broadway. Uh, it was his first play on Broadway. Uh, he then went on to do, you know. A, Incredible wonderful movies, too, but he started on te in television. Mm -hmm. And he wrote Middle of the Night as a craft theater mm -hmm. with E.G. Marshall and Stephen Hill and uh, even Marie Saint. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it went to Broadway, and I replaced Lee Phillips, who left the play to do Peyton Place, the movie. Mm -hmm. And Patty had seen me and wanted me in this role because he'd seen me do uh, some work in Kurt's class and uh, felt that I knew more about that character than he did. He knew a, a guy in the army and he wrote the, the, the guy. And at any rate, I, uh, I wound up in the play. Uh, Josh Lohman directing and, and uh, Edward G. Robinson, the star. Jenna Rollins played my wife. It was her first play on Broadway. Hmm. And then we toured uh, to California, and uh, I found myself here. Uh, my ex-wife was in the play as well uh, during the national tour, mm -hmm. Barbara, and uh, anyway, Hitchcock 
saw the show on opening night. Next thing I knew, I got a call. Uh, even though the character was 180 degrees from the character I played in the middle of the night, I found myself in North by Northwest mm -hmm. as a result. So there were things that led to other things. Uh, the role I played in the middle of the night was a macho, kind of uh, crass, insensitive, uh, egocentric musician. Mm -hmm. And Hitchcock cast me as a very economical, quiet, and I played him as a homosexual. Dangerous character, uh, very, very economical. I've never played anything like it since, hmm. never before. So, uh, did you wonder what it was that Hitchcock saw in there that made him? Well, I've, I've told this story, and I, 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 I wondered, and I asked him. Yeah. And uh, I was having tea one day with Peggy Robertson, Alfred Hitchcock and the kid, <laughs> and, and, and we were in the portable dressing room, and I said, I, I, how did you see me in that play and cast me in this role, Mr. Hitchcock? And he said, Martin, you have a circus going on inside of you. <laughs> Obviously, if you can do that part of the theater, you can do this little trinket. <laughs> And that was his explanation. Which is good as any, I suppose. <laughs> Basically, I think he saw a lot of energy, and I felt if I could contain it, I, there would be a sense of danger. And uh, the character, I felt, was really very smart and ahead of everybody in terms of what was going on, and very controlled. And uh, the reason I chose to play him as homosexual, very slightly, because, I, you know, 1950s, you didn't... Right. It wasn't written that way, but I, I figured I'd just be a henchman. Right. I'm not gay, and everyone said, you're gonna, again, you know, I started listening to people. Yeah. They said, you're going to play the guy. I said, you know, you, you, you won't have a career. I said, what are you talking about? I'm an actor. Right. Anyway, I, I, the logic was that this guy was so desperate to get rid of Eva Marie Saint that I felt it was a, a terrific choice. Yeah. Uh, the only person I know that didn't like my choice was James Mason, because it, <laughs> it cast an aspersions on his character. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 but Hitchcock let me go. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, he liked it. And he virtually didn't direct me, so I just did what I did, you know. I, 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 he would whisper things to people, and, and he never said anything to me at all, you know. And I, you know, coming from the theater and stuff, I, you know, I felt so. I, one day, I, I mean, we were shooting in the uh, auction gallery, and he had said something to Mason, and said something to Cary Grant, and said something, to him, and walked past me. So I, I said, is there anything you want to tell me? He said, I, I'll only tell you if I don't like what you're doing. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> did, did you ever, I mean, in a situation like that, here you are a fairly young actor and you're working around people that could be considered legends. Um, did yeah. you find yourself intimidated and what did you do to well, overcome that? Or did you just... I, I was so busy working. <laughs> you you know, doing... Uh, yeah, there was Cary Grant, there was Alfred Hitchcock, there was James Mason, Eva Marie, Leo G. Carroll. Yeah. Uh, quite a group. Yeah. Uh, but they made me feel comfortable. And I, I, I was very concentrated on what I was doing as well. You know, I mean, I was, it's not a huge part, but I wanted it to be very intense. And I was- Which uh, it was. Yeah, I, I, I didn't allow a lot of things to, kind of intimidate me or uh -huh. get in. Uh -huh. I, I think, you know, once I, I mentioned, you know, never being able to please Lee Strasberg. Uh -huh. It was, 
you talk about a tough guy, I mean, sure. he was tough. Uh, the day I stopped trying to please him, I started to. Right. So it was about doing my work. Right. Working with Strasbourg made me tough in a certain way, in terms mm -hmm. of making choices and, and trusting them and going with them and having a bit of a... Kurt Conway used to use a, a, an expression from time to time, and I remembered it, and I liked it, and even though I... He used to say something, actor's arrogance. And he didn't mean that you needed to be arrogant. He named you had to have a certain kind of arrogance to be able to trust yourself in the throes of a situation where you know, a lot of things are going on where you have to be able to home in on what you're doing without being, without dividing by two or three or four or questioning yourself continually, making choices and then trusting that choice. Uh, I learned a long time ago that if a director doesn't like what you're doing, he'll tell you. Hmm. And when they don't talk, you're in good shape. And I basically haven't been directed in maybe 20 years because I come in with stuff. A good director creates a playground and lets you play. And if you're, you know, that they often don't know what they want until they see it. So. One of my favorite Coppola stories, when I was doing Tucker, I remember there was a scene I had to do, and we had shot the piece before, it hadn't shot the piece after, you know, and I had been thinking about it, mulling it over, and I walked up to Francis, I said, you know, I've been thinking about this, Francis, I could, there's a lot of ways I could go, I could play this, I literally could play this 10, 15 different ways. He said, great, great, pick the best one. <laughs> And he walked away. Yeah. And I said, yeah, what am I bothering him with that for? He's, he's got a 51 Tuckers to worry about. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, a thousand extras. And he doesn't want it. And, and Woody Allen you know, doesn't talk about anything about your, your role. I mean, he doesn't direct you at all. Right. You know, I mean, you're on your, he'd talk about other things, talk about the circus talk about Connecticut, but he won't talk about your character, so you're really on your own. Uh, but I, I like that. I mean, you got a whole bullet base to pick from. I mean, there are never two people I've ever met in my life who are alike, so why would I even play a character like another character mm -hmm. I've played. Mm -hmm. Because that character's needs, desires, predilections with relation to that specific script and what that character has to fulfill in that script can't be like any other character per se. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not character 12A. <laughs> I've done, you know, over 100 movies and probably over 500 television shows, and I don't think I've ever repeated a character. Because that's what makes it fun. What do I do this time? How do I add to this piece? And it's, it's always, I still like it, is what I'm saying. I really get a kick out of it, because each time it's a new adventure. I've always said, you know, over the years I've taught acting, uh, and, you know, all the time I was ever teaching, I, I was always acting. I never made my living as a teacher. Right. And I taught, you know, Jack Nicholson was my student for three years, and Harry Dean Stanton, and, and uh, Angelica Houston, and Oliver Stone before he directed his first movie, and mm -hmm. Shirley Knight, a lot of people. Mm -hmm over the years. 
And if I wasn't doing what I was telling them to do, I don't think they would have stuck around. Because, I mean, I, by example, would be out there all the time. And I just felt that was important. Uh, anyway, the first group I, I, I worked with there were about 16 people. Uh, Robert Town was an actor in that class before he started writing. Uh, um, Carol Eastman, who wrote Five Easy Pieces, and think, act, she was an actress and she became a writer. It was an interesting group uh, that stayed together for three years, literally, that like nucleus of people. And uh, I, you know, I basically used to say, everyone can walk and talk. Your job is to create magic. And I really, I still believe that. I really believe that. I mean, create something <coughs> that says something that best tells that story and doesn't pull the audience out of that story. You're part of that piece. Anyway. It's making the choices, right? I mean. I keep hearing you say you make the choices. And well, you go choices them of all and, kinds, you know, physical choices right. and emotional choices and regional choices. And uh, I like I like characters that frighten me huh. when I read them. Yeah. When I say I don't know where to begin. Whoa! I mean, with Ed Wood, I mean, I literally didn't know where to begin. What I. Uh -huh. I got a call from someone I didn't know, Tim Burton hmm. called me, and I, I thought it was a friend of mine joking. <laughs> <laughs> he said, this, hello, this is Tim Burton. I said, yeah, this is Thomas Jefferson or something. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I was, I was very, very, uh, <laughs> I, I Slip did, and glib. Well, because, I mean, it, it just seemed illogical, yeah. that, because the next thing he said was, uh, uh, there's a messenger on his way, uh, there's a script coming, uh, check out the part of Bela and get back to me. And I said, uh, sure. <laughs> and he said, this is my number at the studio and this is my home. And I wrote the two numbers down and I said, okay, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> and then, about half an hour later, a messenger came with a script. You know, I, I almost said, I don't think I'm right for Bella Abzug. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> but I had no idea, if, you know, it was what it was. When I read it, I said, my God. You know, because I knew a little bit about Ed Wood and, and, and his films. Uh, I'd seen uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space and, uh, and I, I, uh, Glenn or Glenda. And, um, but I didn't really know that much about him. And, uh, and I'd seen Lugosi films ever since I was a kid. And then I called him the next morning at the uh, at the studio, and they said he wasn't there, and I said, "Well, I'll call him at home." Now I realized it was Tim Burton, and of course this. <laughs> and then I called this number he gave me, and he he got on the he answered the phone, and he said, "What do you think?" I said, "I think it's great. I, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I mean, to to do this movie." He said, uh, "You're interested?" I said, "Yeah, I'm interested." And he said, well, why don't you come to the studio? Uh, he was at the Goldwyn studio, which was a Warner Hollywood studio, which is now called The Lot on Formosa. And uh, I, I went over and met him there. And, you know, I don't know if you know Tim, but, uh, <laughs> but you, know, it's, you know, it's like meeting Edward Scissorhand, you know. <laughs> He's, he's great, you know, but I mean, it's like, yeah. 
he said, what, what do you think, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, it's on you know, so I, I said, you know, it's great, I mean, he said, you know, you're my first and only choice, and I said, well, that's great, hmm. he said, yeah, and, uh, you know, Johnny Depp is going to play Ed Wood, and, and Johnny and I were talking, and, uh, and if you don't do it, we're not doing the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. But no pressure. No, no, no pressure. I, I, I said, I never... Wow. I said, well, that's very flattering, but... <laughs> I said, you know, there's 100,000 actors in SAG. He said, I don't know anyone else who can do it. I said, what are you talking about? I don't know if I can do it. I said, you've written a character who's a 74-year-old Hungarian morphine addict, <laughs> alcoholic, who has mood swings. I said, that would be hard enough, but he's got to be Bela Lugosi. I said, I said, I mean, this is, you know, this could be the worst thing that ever happened. Yeah. I, said, I grew up with guys, you know, I both will think you're blah. You know? I mean, Frank Gorshin and all these people. And he said, I said, he said, well, uh, I said, I'm game as hell. So we did makeup tests and all kinds of things. And, uh, and then I, I went away. I was doing a movie called uh, Intersection up in... Uh, Canada, Western Canada, in Vancouver, and Tim kept sending me Lugosi movies <laughs> and interviews that he did and all kinds of things. And if you saw Intersection, you will know that I had a lot of time to look at these cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I watched 35 Lugosi movies. And, and a couple of them were, w would make the Ed Wood movies look like Gone with the Wind. <laughs> there was one called Bella Lugosi Meets a Brooklyn Gorilla. <laughs> now you've got to really see this movie. A Brooklyn Gorilla? Yes. It's about two guys who were, were under contract, early 50s, under contract to Universal, uh -huh. who were like the road company Martin and Lewis. Huh. One guy sang, and the other guy, who looked something like Sherry Lewis, did spastic humor. <laughs> and they're on an island, and everyone's running around in moo-moos. <laughs> and on this island is a castle, and in the castle is a mad scientist. Of course. Guess who? Yeah. <laughs> and this fellow is injecting little monkeys with a serum. The monkey overnight turns into a guy in an awful gorilla suit. <laughs> With and, a Brooklyn accent. No. Well, no. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, the two guys were from Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Gorilla wasn't from Brooklyn. <laughs> we wouldn't have allowed it. Anyway, within this context, Lugosi is wonderful. I, 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 I couldn't believe how seriously he took it and how he... Now, you have to know he was very ill. He was in, you know, morphine addiction. Uh, I mean, he was... And yet, he was working hard. And I, I was so impressed watching this movie that I fell in love with the guy. I, I went to San the French to try to get Hungarian dialect tapes, and there weren't any. So I bought Hungarian language tapes and began to work on where the tongue went so that I wanted it to be a perfect Hungarian accent. Now, hung Hungarian uh, is an odd language. The accent's not like any other language. It's very hard to lose it. If you, the Gabors have been here 50 years, they sound like they just got off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but, but they can't say a W at all. Uh, 
bow, 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 run, run. They can't. So, uh, and then I did something that only Peter Medak, who's Hungarian, noticed. Even though I got great reviews and won a lot of awards, I mean, every award, actually, which was unheard of, uh, Peter Medak called me and said, Martin, very good Hungarian. And I said, thank you. He said, you must be Hungarian. I said, no. I, he said, do you know why? I said, why? He said it was very good because you are not an actor trying to do a Hungarian accent. You're a character trying not to, oh. which is what I did. No. He didn't want the accent. It sounds crazy, but that's exactly what I did. Huh. It's like, again, it's an old axiom of mine. I mean, when I talk about acting, I often talk about you know, I always say bad actors try to cry. Good actors try not to. Bad actors try to laugh. Good actors try not to. Bad actors play drunk. Good actors play sober. <laughs> how a character hides his feelings tells us who he is, not how he shows his feelings. No one shows their feelings. People don't try to cry. You fill up and then you do what that character does to hold it in. And what spills out, if it spills out, tells us what's going on. Hmm. I mean, who tries to show what they're feeling? People don't show. I had a terrible day today, everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> no, people hold on. You know, yeah. you know, you may tell a close friend something personal or revealing, but you don't go around, you know, you watch people when, when they're moving, even in a movie, dark movie theater, when they're crying, where it's somewhat safe, you, you know, it's like, are they, has anyone seen me <laughs> cry? It's, it's, it's not about show and tell. It's about filling up and then defining how that character would hold his stuff in and go about his life. Well, Trying to do an accent was not in keeping with that thinking. Getting the accent and trying not to do it was in keeping with it. Anyway. That's great. <laughs> I'm not finished. No, I know. <laughs> you just hit a pearl there, though. Everybody, had, uh, that really resonated. Um, I wonder if we could just for a second digress for a moment because we've moved to a different point in your career, but I didn't want to miss out Let's talk on... about Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to miss out on, on uh, Mission Impossible and uh, what led you to that role and what that experience was like. Well, uh, I mentioned a, a class that I had. Uh, one of the people in that class was a young writer called Bruce Geller mm -hmm. who wanted to learn about acting. So he came into that class as a writer who wanted to learn about acting, and Bruce Geller created Mission Impossible. And he cast, he actually wrote a character called Roland Hand. Originally it was called Martin Land. Hmm. And uh, Cinnamon Carter was originally written for Barbara Bain, my ex-wife, and Barbara read and went through a process and Bruce unconsciously wanted her because he wanted a character who was virtually like a Marilyn Monroe and a Grace Kelly in the same embodiment. 
someone who could be sexy and very ladylike and or both, and the only member of the team who could get into the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to do a television series. Mm -hmm. I was busy doing other things, but he wrote a character for me in the pilot, mm -hmm. Martin Land initially, mm -hmm. in which I played a South American, as a guest star really, South American dictator, then we kidnap him and I impersonate the South American dictator. I play the character ultimately became Rollin Hand because, you know, I said, Martin Land, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know. <laughs> so he made it uh, Martin Hand and I said, no, Martin. So he made it Rollin Hand and they, the same number of type spaces it was before word processes. So it wouldn't have, been a, <laughs> wouldn't have been a problem today. He could white it out at any rate. So, uh, and I played like four or five characters on the pilot. Mm -hmm. But I was only to do the pilot. Uh, I didn't want to do a series. I had turned down Star Trek. Right. Which you know, most people don't know this. You were first choice. I was the first choice for. Spock character, and I passed on that. Uh, I, I, I thought it would kill me to play an emotionless character. <laughs> I mean, really. Right. I mean, it was a wonderful idea, but it would not, not for me it wasn't. At, and Bruce Geller's office and Gene Roddenberry's office were next to each other at Desmond. Mm. So uh, Lucy was our boss, Lucille Ball. We were Desilu show. I mean, Paramount bought Desilu during this period. And Lucy went to the Solar Studio, but she had nothing on the air but the Lucy show. She was forewalling other shows, so Ben Casey was there and Hogan's Heroes, but she didn't own any of them. Mm -hmm. She wanted to get some properties. So that year she put on Star Trek and Mission Impossible. Wow. One on NBC, one on CBS. <coughs> and I, well, when the pilot sold, the network said, we want Lando on the show too. And I said, whoa. I said, well, I, 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 I'm not going to sign a series deal. I didn't do it then. I'm not going to do it now. So I agreed to guest star on whatever shows they wanted me on during the season. Mm -hmm. But I had the option. They didn't. With two weeks notice, I could leave the show at any time. Hmm. Now that was a not a good move on their part <laughs> because it created lots of problems downstream. But I, I did the 28 out of the first 30 shows the first year as a guest star. In fact, we, we, I originated billing that is now very conventional. I didn't want to be in the main titles because because I wouldn't be able to leave. So when the first year, Stephen Hill, the second year, Peter Graves, mm -hmm. threw down my picture at the top. It said, special appearance by Martin Landau mm -hmm. as Rollin Hand. Mm -hmm. The word special appearance by had never been used before as billing, ever. Mm -hmm. I originated it. It's still, now it's special appearance by all the time. Mm -hmm. But it, it had not, we were trying to figure out what language to use <coughs> so that uh, it could be slightly separate and yet not part of the main titles but part of the opening of the show. So the, the very word special appearance by had never been used before and we chose that. And mm. the first year I was a guest star on 28 out of 30 shows. <laughs> and then the second year I signed to do the series, and I was on the main titles, but I had the option to continue at the end of the year or not, mm -hmm. and the third season again, and so on. So it was an interesting experience. Do you look back on it as a good experience? Good experience. Part? Yeah. Absolutely. We loved each other. We had a great group. We were generous with each other. We had a lot of fun. Uh, it was unique, a very un unusual show in its time. It was very filmic, very cinematic. I, I sort of played a one-man rep company. I mean, I played, I played, you know, Adolf Hitler and Martin Borman, myself younger and blonde, older and 80-year-old, 90s, all kinds of accents. I played Germans, 
I believe the Russians. In fact, uh, uh, well, we weren't really Russians. We were from places like Slavovia. <laughs> 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 but we were Middle European, you know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I remember once a fellow from Pravda came to visit us, a, 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 a journalist who was living in New York, and he came to visit our set. And he said, hey, Mr. Landau, very nice to meet you, yes. You know, I live in New York, and it's very embarrassing for me. I have a young son, he's 12 years old, and it's very embarrassing. I said, what's embarrassing? He said, my son, very, he has no accent, speaks like a Yankee, very American. <laughs> he says to me, hey, Pop, how come all the bad guys talk like you? <laughs> What are you working on now? What's, uh, what's coming up next? I, I'm, uh, well, I, I'm doing a, a movie. Uh, I have a kind of interestingly, not large, a picture with uh, Harrison Ford and, uh, and Josh uh, Hartnett uh -huh. that uh, Ron Shelton is directing and having written a, a New York, uh, not New York, Los Angeles a cop movie. It's, in fact, it's called the untitled Ron Shelton Los Angeles cop movie. <laughs> Uh, that's what it's called. Uh, so. <laughs> it's also known uh, as uh, working uh, two cops. <laughs> it doesn't have a title yet. So, uh, and I'm playing a character that's based on Robert Evans. Oh. It's not Rob. I'm not going to do. Right. He's got his own movie out right now. Yes, he does. He? <laughs> Which is very good. You know, the kid stays in the picture. <laughs> I saw Bob recently. Hey, you know, survivors with survivors, right? Yeah. That kid. Hey, let's take some pictures. Anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's go to some uh, questions from the members. Questions. Uh, all right. Let's see here. Um, where's uh, Zach Rowland? Yes, sir, Mr. Nando. Uh, my question was, and actually you covered it earlier, but if you could spout on it, um, at what point in your life, other than the day that you walked, stood up and walked over to the the chair and asked the gentleman what you needed to do to leave your regular job. Uh, what point did you realize from working a day job itself to wanting to be an actor? I think it was a, a metamorphosis of a certain kind. The day job you're talking about was also something I wanted to do in that when I was, before I could read, My parents would go out on a Saturday night and come back with a bunch of newspapers. New York had seven newspapers, eight newspapers at the time. And they'd come back, and, and there was the Daily News that had a funny, you know, comic section. A Daily Mirror that had a comic section. A Journal American that had a comic section. A Herald Tribune that had a comic section. And they'd leave them, the comic sections, and a chair next to my bed. And in the morning, I'd wake up, and there were these colored comic sections. The Daily News had Dick Tracy on the cover, and Smitty on the back cover. The Journal had Bringing Up Father. The Mirror had Mickey Mouse. And I couldn't read, but I looked at these pictures, and there were worlds. It was Crazy Cat by George Harriman. Mm -hmm. and and before I could read, I was intrigued with the world of, a fantasy world of comics. So that was my first love. The next love was when I was six or seven years old. I went to the movies and I went to the theater, living in New York. I saw the White Horse Inn, an operetta at, at the Center Theater, which was a the sister theater to the Radio City Music Hall. Anyway, what I'm basically saying is the two things I chose to do were things that were ingrained in my brain somehow and in my heart somehow. So that pursuing that world to create, it, it's almost the same thing. It's creating a world with pen and ink and color and creating a world with your own 
physical instrument, your body and mind and emotion and voice. So they're just steps in something that I wanted to do from the time I was little. So I can't call that quite a day job, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It was more of a, something drove me to do it. I don't know what. And, and to become an actor, I don't know what made me do either of those things. There was something, an impetus that was completely, I don't know, it was some life force within me that just made me do it. I had no choice. Great. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Danny Arroyo. They told me to wait for this. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned his name earlier, and uh, my question was about James Dean. I know you must have some very pleasant, fond memories about him, or some stories you maybe don't want to tell anybody, but maybe you can share with us. <laughs> <laughs> Back times in New York, acting class, maybe scenes together. Well, yeah, we, we, I, I directed him a lot, actually. I directed a number of things he did, uh, audition scenes, other things, uh, and he would pass judgment on things I did. Mm -hmm. Even when I was doing, I remember he'd come back uh, from being out of town, and I was doing a play called Goat Song uh, with his girlfriend, Barbara Glenn. Uh, we played the Alfred Lent, uh, Lynn Fontaine roles in a, in a revival of, of, of a Franz Werfel play that had been done in 1926 by the Theater Guild, and this was the first time it had been done in New York uh, since, and it was 1953. And Edward G. Robinson, who was a member of the Theater Guild, played Five the Jew in, in, in the original production, and Jimmy came and uh, the director gave us notes, and then we went out afterwards, and Jimmy gave us notes. More notes than the director gave us. Uh, you know, we were young actors, uh, talked about acting a lot, talked about dreams a lot. Uh, Jim was a complicated kid, but so was I. I mean, this idea of his, you know, wanting to die a premature death was, is absolutely on uh, a lot of things that are said about him in retrospect. I mean, there are, you know, a number of writers have, have, have based books on the fact that he was quote unquote homosexual. Well, they're homosexual. They want him to be homosexual. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't gay. He may have experimented a little bit here and there, but he wasn't gay. I know the women in his life, and uh, but anyway, you can say anything you want about someone after they're gone. Uh, the fact that he had a death wish, he didn't have a death wish, he wanted to live. Uh, he wasn't going that fast on the, on, on, you know, he was in, in one of the very few Porsche spiders in the country. There were about four or five of them in the entire country. No one was used to seeing a car that was that low. Uh, where the sun was, it was a silver car. Uh, he wasn't seen. He was only doing about 65 or 70 miles an hour. Uh, we do that on freeways all the time. Uh, it was an open road and there was a guy who made a turn that, because he didn't see the car. Uh, at any rate, Jim had done about 20 some television shows, a couple of plays, and uh, three motion pictures. He died at the age of 24. A lot of people say he was immature. I don't know a lot of people who were <laughs> very mature, having done, you know, everything happened very quickly. Uh, was he ready for everything? Probably not. No one is when things are piled on you that quickly. and. and uh, in a very short period of time, he did a, a lot of work and uh, was growing as an actor. Uh, at any rate, I could go on and on and on, but 
uh, it was a loss, a huge loss in my life. Uh, he was a very close friend of mine, and uh, and it's it's peculiar. In fact, I wrote a piece in TV Guide about the fact that I, you know, I, I mean, he's frozen in time. Uh, places I can, I, if I go to Prague or I go to uh, uh, anywhere, even. Uh, Place like Wazazat in Morocco, or uh, there's a T-shirt shop, souvenir shop, and often there'll be a a life-size cutout of Jimmy wearing the rebel red jacket with a cigarette, you know. And it's like I've I've gotten used to it, you know. Uh, it was peculiar at first because it was like, I mean, you know, places I'd never been to, places that should be new and strange, and suddenly there's Jimmy in the window. <laughs> uh, it's become, you know, I knew Marilyn as well, and I knew, you know, I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's, um, there are certain icons that keep popping up on t shirts. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Christy Schoen. Christy? There she is. I was wondering, um, being that you're a talented actor and all, um, <laughs> What's that? What? <laughs> <laughs> if there was a point, like a really low point in your acting co career where you felt very discouraged and, and probably questioned yourself if you were doing the right thing. Well, I never questioned myself whether I was doing the right thing, but I questioned my, I, I you know, I, I mean, yes, I've, I've described my career as a roller coaster ride. There are ups, there are downs, there are times that things were good. I've had several different kinds of careers. I had a career in the theater to some degree, and then I had a, a theater, a career in television, and then I had a. Actually, when I first came here, first I did movies, then I did television, and people didn't hire me for movies anymore. There were times when I, yeah. You know, I w when I did uh, Space 1999, I was in basically in London for four years. Uh, mainly, we went there as a family, uh, Barbara and I working again after Mission Impossible together. We worked in a television series for Sir Lou Grade, who then became Lord Lou Grade. Mm -hmm. uh, and we lived. Uh, in England for the better part of four years, uh, mainly because that's where the work was and we wanted to try and keep our family together. If Barbara at that time was doing one show and I was doing another or we weren't uh, this way, we were all together. And uh, it was also, I think, a good experience for our kids to get them, let's say, out of the Beverly Hills School system and into a different world. Uh, the American School in London had all kinds of different kids from everywhere in the United States, you know, f guys that worked at the embassy, guys who were in the oil business, bankers, this, uh, and, 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 they, and they virtually got a chance to uh, spend time with people from Dubuque mm -hmm. and, and uh, Kansas City. And uh, it's crazy. To say this, but you know, we actually went to England so that our kids could experience American kids from other <laughs> places, uh, and uh, it uh, I felt was a good thing. Uh, then, when of course you come back after this, uh, and there's a uh, out of sight, out of mind. You know, I mean, uh, to begin with, when I did went over there to do this show was uh, after Mission Impossible and, and not a lot of, of feature people were breaking the doors down. But television, uh, you know, there was a, a pilot I, we did for Steve Spielberg called Savage. It was uh, the last thing Steve ever directed on television. Uh, Levinson and Lake, who produced Columbo, produced it and Barbara and I uh, did it together in which I played a character not unlike a Mike Wallace, uh, an investigative reporter. 
it was television doing television and, and before we did the pilot, which was an NBC pilot for Universal, I even called Julian Goodman, who was then head of uh, NBC News, and said, do you have a problem with me playing a, an investigative reporter on your network because we're going to go after you know, things like the FDA and this and that. You know, it was going to be an intelligent show about um, uh, things that mattered. It was television doing television, and it hadn't done that yet. Uh, and of course, we did a pilot, and I had a fight to get Steve Spielberg to direct it, which he did. He was 22 years old. He had mm. just done uh, Duel, mm. and, uh, and, and because it was a talkie show, we felt that it needed a very cinematic hand. And this young f fellow called Spielberg uh, was willing to break rules. And uh, Sid Scheinberg, who was then head of television uh, at Universal, said, well, he's going to go over budget. I said, well, how many pilots do you have? What, six or seven? And I only care about this one. And, and we really want Steve to do it. And he said, blah, blah, blah. And anyway, I walked out of the office and, and uh, said, no Steve, no Martin Barber. And he chased us down to the elevators and said, you got him. And, and that's how we got Steve to direct it. And there was the last thing, right after that he did Sugarland Express and then of course Jaws. Mm. What became of that guy? I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, uh, that series was shot down by the NBC News Department, mm. ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise, I mean, huh? Because it was, uh, in that particular pilot movie of the week, uh, Barry Sullivan played a Supreme Court justice appointee who uh, was married and knew this young girl, whether question whether he had an affair with her, she happens to fall out of a window and die. Uh, and this wealthy man played by uh, Grandpa Walton, will will uh, hear uh, has something on him, and not unlike the hunts of Texas at the time, the question was, would this multimillionaire have a hold on a Supreme Court justice and use it to benefit himself? Now, this parallels some things that were going on in, in our country at the time. At any rate, the series did not get on the air for numbers of reasons. I went from being the best pilot NBC and Universal had to being shown at midnight mm. on a Monday night or something. Anyway, that's show business. So, so when you found yourself discouraged, I mean, what kinds of things pulled you through it? Did you then focus uh, on other interests in your life? Um, how do you take the pressure off wanting to regain you have to believe in yourself and never, I mean, they're, they're, it's very easy to waver, it's very easy to, one of the things that it's not terrific to do is to feel sorry for yourself. Mm. I always say, mm. I never use self-pity in a character because audiences don't care about a character who feels sorry for himself. Audiences like characters that have fight in them. Mm. And I've learned from the characters I've played. Mm. The characters I've been nominated for, by and large, are characters who fight. Yeah. The character in Tucker yeah. winds up being a bigger person than he started out mm -hmm. by enlarging his life. The character in Crimes and Misdemeanors is not a larger person, but he does get through a terrible time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Lugosi was a poet of, of doom. Mm -hmm. 
in a way, mm. who never, never acknowledged it. Mm. He refused to see the failure in his life. And I believe that's an important element for everyone to have. Never think of yourself as a loser. Never think of yourself as a failure. Take that feeling and turn it into something positive. I think it's within our means to do that. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to become depressed. It's a tough, tough world out there. But I always say, and I've said this to my students, and I'll say it to you. I said it earlier, I said create magic. When you get a chance to read, they don't know what they want. Don't try to please them, please you. Kick ass. <laughs> Bring. <laughs> Bring something large of yourself into that room. Bring your energy into that room. Make choices and trust them and go. And it's, if they don't hire you, it's their loss, not yours. Yeah. And that's the actor's arrogance I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to back it up. And Periodically, I mean, audition for the studio, it doesn't matter how old you are. Go to workshops and classes when you start feeling down. Get out there and act a little bit. Don't sit in your room and feel sorry for yourself. Get out there and kick ass somewhere. <laughs> Make yourself feel good again. Let pe other people acknowledge, hey, you're pretty damn good. <laughs> you gotta hear that. You don't hear it when you're alone in your room. I do. Sound I like I'm doing room. cabaret. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Evan Mc, uh, McNamara. Evan. Um, <laughs> this is actually pretty similar to the, to the question we had just asked, uh, more specific. Um, after you've been in a picture that, or any project that does poorly, critically or box office, how do you, how do you bounce back from that? How do you get the next job without being ruined? You know what I mean? Sit down. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, Last year I did a movie called The Majestic. We had a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. It was a chance for Jim Carrey to play a character like a James Stewart character. I had fun. We had high hopes for the movie and 12 people saw it. <laughs> Six of them were nasty critics. <laughs> it was a disappointment. Jim was disappointed, I was disappointed, Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont's two pictures before that were The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile, two fairly successful movies, pretty damn good movies. We were beaten up. We came out the same week that The Beautiful Mind came out, uh, Lord of the Rings came out, yeah. Ali. Nice. No one saw it. No one went. Beautiful movie. Spend a long time working on it. You have a great time working it. You have high hopes for it. It don't allow it to do any more than say, too bad. Need a new job. Got to wake up. Do something else. That's that. It'll catch up with itself. Now people are beginning to see it on DVDs and on, especially on airplanes. <laughs> They're trapped. <laughs> 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 I, 
I tell you, I have more people come up to me and say, hey, I, you know, I flew back from, uh, I saw that picture that you did last year. Yeah. Well, what's it called? Uh, Majestic. Yeah. They had to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the point is that you, know, you, you were very good in that movie. It's like, like your, your best kept secret in the world. <laughs> it, it, uh, I was happy with what I did in the movie. I was happy with the movie. And uh, there are disappointments along the way. But it's, it's just what it is. And you go on. You do a play in town. You want it to be accepted. The playwright gets it. The director gets it. You get it. OK. That doesn't mean you stop doing it. You can't please everybody, and you never will. Hmm. Expectation is not a good thing. To expect something is to be dis become disappointed. To hope. To anticipate, but not to expect. If you, it's deadly. Any time you expect something, you're in trouble. I promise you. You can't expect anything. Thank you. Thank you, um, Arthur Ribeiro. Um, I grew up in Portugal, where I, as a kid, watched Space 1999, and only slowly I, I get to know your career by a mismatched chronology, because only later on I saw, you know, the Alfred Hitchcock movies, and then, <laughs> so, and it is a fabulous and amazing career, and my question is, when did you have most fun? Was it like back in 50s, 60s, is it still today, does it? I'm still having fun. You're still having fun. Yes. <laughs> sure. But was, it, was there a different back, you know, when, you know, when you were working with John Cassavetes and a lot of rules were being broken and a lot of new things were happening? Does it feel that today you don't have, you know, there are no more original ideas or? Well, there's always original ideas. Uh, they say there were just so many plot lines and mm -hmm. so on, but. Uh, in 1985, when I was in Sesimbra and Setubal, and in Lisbon, right, Susie? Uh, working in Portugal with uh, Raul Ruiz, who's a Chilean director living in Paris, but filming a lot in Portugal. Uh, I was having a great time then. Uh, I was having a great time when I was out of work in the 50s, when I started to work in the 60s, when I was out of work in the 70s, when I started to work in the 70s, when I was working in the 80s, when I wasn't working so much in the 80s, when I was working in the 90s, hey, it's all great. And, and all of it gives me more and more colors to put on my, my palette. Uh, the more pain, I always tell actors, one of the things that one should really embrace is pain. Actors suffer a great deal of pain. People suffer a great deal of pain, but actors, most people run away from their pain. They do who wants to go there? It's painful. Actors should really acknowledge and embrace their pain. That's what good performances are made out of. The character and death of a salesman, loaded with pain, put stuff on top of it. But when that stuff starts to chip away, that's what makes a great Willie Loman. That's what makes a great Blanche. That what, that's what makes a great mother in Glass Menagerie, Lorette Taylor.
pain is one of the things that an actor should pay a lot of attention to. The great parts are loaded with it. It doesn't mean you imbue yourself and wallow in it. It means you recognize it and do what courageous people do and characters do is to fight it, deny it, have it. King Lear, I mean, my God, if you look at the, the great roles, and how many of you don't go there? Because who wants to? Oh, I don't want to. Don't wake up. Oh, I'm not going to go there. What I'm saying is all of your life experience, as you get older, the more of it you can put into your work, the better off you are. By the same token, you can also say, you know, I'm only going to paint with black and white this time. This doesn't need all of that. I don't have to do that. Econ economical and simplicity will serve this character well. I only need a few colors. I don't need the whole rainbow. And to be able to make that choice comes with age as well. This character doesn't need to be that complicated. I don't have to have all of those layers of stuff. I only need a couple. This is, a, this is going to be a lot of fun. But what I'm saying is, the reason I still like it is because it's still an adventure. And it always should be. It's, uh, if I ever write a book, it's going to be called, Acting Can Be Fun. <laughs> <laughs> And it's great to worry it when you first get it and say, what am I going to do? Hey, boy, God, oh. And then you find your way. And then make choices and trust those choices and go with it and trust your instrument. It is an instrument. Most of the training that I did and most of the training I taught was about getting the instrument to be an instrument. I believe an actor should be able to pick up any, pe any piece of material and act it the way a good musician picks up a piece of music and plays it. The way a dancer hears music and dances. And one of the things that I used to train actors with and about was getting the voice, the body, and the emotions together. Because a lot of actors have splits. The voice leads, the body follows. The body leads, the voice follows. The emo oh, mm, ha, splits. In a well-trained instrument, impulse, everything happens at once. Bing, ha, 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 all happens. And, and that's not a lot of actors have that going for them. I'm always amazed at opera singers. I mean, God. What they have to do, they have to learn a libretto, they have to learn to sing over an orchestra, act, and hit notes that are gargantuan <laughs> in a foreign language. Mm. <laughs> it's like, my God, is that hard. Only certain people can do it well. And dancers, my God, they defy gravity. They have to wake up early in the morning, go to the bar, stretch at work and hurt, turn out, ow! They kill themselves. Discipline, discipline, defy gravity. Leap off stage into a wall. <laughs> Hard and a short life. Actors, if they took their work 
as seriously as those two other people I just mentioned, be better off. It's not about walking and talking. Soap operas are, why are they simplistic? It's because the good guys play good guys, the bad guys play bad guys. Good guys never really know they're good guys because they have a lot of bad things they've done and bad guys never think they're bad guys because they think they're good guys. Hitler, you know, Hitler, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, what I'm saying is fleshing out a human being is, is bringing as many elements into that character that will define it and tell that story is, is what your job is as an actor. And it's a great job. It's a great job. And it's hard to get that job. And it's very competitive. And there's so many people out there. And there are a lot of lousy actors who are working. Hmm. Hmm. Because a lot of the casting directors are lousy casting directors and don't know good actors when they see it. And that's what you're up against. And know it. But that shouldn't stop you. And it shouldn't depress you. A very small percentage of a large union are working every week. Very few. Some work continually. And out of that other pool of thousands and thousands a handful of you on any given week will get a decent job. You have to kick ass to get the job, and you have to kick ass when you get the job, and you hopefully hope it gets together and shows you off in some way that will help you get the next job. And it's hard. You got to be nuts to want to do it. <laughs> But you gotta want to do it, and you gotta lo you gotta love it, because it's great. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Christy Abart. Uh, my question is basically: you've been lucky enough, or talented enough, to work in all the different mediums of performance in on the theater, on the stage, in TV, in movies. Is there any one that's your favorite, or do you have pros and cons on each of them that you would share with us? No, they all, they're all different, and yet they all insist on pretty much the same stuff. Truth. Uh, theater, which is where I started, is, you know, you've heard it before, but there's an excitement. Uh, you know, there's that, there's that almost kinesthetic. You feel an audience, you feel them breathing, you sense them, they respond. There's, a, there's something miraculous about being on a stage in a good play. And I, I, I've described this before because when something is going on up there, you have a thousand strangers in a theater. Everyone has experienced the same thing at the same moment. There's laughter. There's fear. There's now, it's, you've got a thousand strangers in a dark room, all virtually experience the same thing at the same moment, when something right is going on up there back and forth. Try and get 10 people, your best friends, in your living room and get them to agree on anything. <laughs> Very hard. I mean, you have great both emotional and cerebral and all kinds of differences if you're sitting and talking to 10 people. I mean, get, get them, getting them all to agree it's not an easy thing on, on lots of levels. 
the magic of the theater is that when that happens, the old joke, you, you, you know, you can hear a cough drop. Uh, uh, but it's quiet. And that's magical. And you can feel that voice bouncing off and through all those bodies. And okay, the theater gives you that. Film does it in a different way. You have to begin to realize when you do film that the camera is that. And yet, it's only one person. You have to be comfortable and completely relaxed in a situation that's very strange, but very, very intimate. That camera, because of its proximity, mm. can read your thoughts and feelings. It recognizes the truth, which means there's a, a level of truth that's needed to create a powerful and good performance. And you have to do it several times in a row, sometimes ten times in a row from different angles. Big emotional scene where you have to start in a place and end in another place with all kinds of stuff going on. Go back to that place, dry off the tears, and take the trip again, newly. I used to say that acting is, if I tell you a joke that's good and you laugh, that's great. Now I tell you the joke again. If you can laugh and take that trip again, you don't need training, you don't need anything. That's what acting is, hearing the same joke again and again and touching your risibility and hearing it as, as if... Now, two things happen that thwart that. One is the result. You know you have to laugh. The joke isn't funny anymore. How do you make it funny again? How do you take that trip? That obligation. You know the punchline, and you know you have to laugh. Both of those are killers. How do you do it? Where you, bingo, again, just as if you, the director says, I want you to explode emotionally. I want the tears to come flying out of your eyes like jets. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> you want me to do that, huh? <laughs> Five times in the master, five times in the two-shot, five times in the over-the-shoulder, where you won't even see the, the tears, and five times in the close-up. And then we'll do a couple of chokers. Whew. Man. Okay. <laughs> Larry Strauss. Mr. Landau. Yes. Not only did I see Majestic, my question's about Majestic. <laughs> oh, In wow. fact, I met you at a bank a few months ago and mentioned it there, and you were very kind in talking to me for a moment. Well, you must have said something nice. <laughs> you, Im you Im imbued your character there with such dignity. I'm wondering if you went a specific place to get yourself to believe, or to want us to believe, that Jim Carrey was in fact your son when we knew damn well he wasn't. That's right. It was imperative 
and my character believe it so that you could there is a problem with the script and I was somewhat aware of it if the picture had started with the accident I mean, a lot of you haven't seen it but I'll speak specifically <laughs> the audience would have learned along with Jim Carrey that he wasn't my son As the picture was released, the audience is way ahead of everybody. In other words, the audience is waiting for the other shoe to drop for an hour. I was very aware of the importance of this character, Harry, believing it so much so that the entire town would believe it but that the audience would actually go along with me knowing full well that he isn't now that's a Herculean job it's impossible actually because you are as an audience saying uh oh Harry's going to be disappointed and yet I felt that I, the character needed to have such, otherwise the picture would have, you would have forget about it. I mean literally forget about it. The fact that it could hold you at all is the fact that there was such a need for this character emotionally to believe that Jim Carrey or Luke was his son. One of the flaws in the picture, unfortunately, is that the audience is way ahead. Probably would have been more interesting if, and again, if the audience didn't know who he was and would find out, excuse me, along with Harry and the townsfolks and, and the wonderful girlfriend. But you should see the movie because it, 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 it's, it's interesting on the level that I'm talking about it. Uh, it might have been received somewhat differently had it not started the way it did. But it, it made my job harder in a way and yet I wanted you to connect emotionally with this guy because, oh. <laughs> because uh, of his need to believe in, in his, the return of a son that <clears throat> died. It, it's basically what the picture hangs on in a certain sense. And I was very aware of that responsibility. Uh, but I, 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 again, embraced that responsibility, and I did uh, the dignity you talk about. I mean, I, I mean, I, again, looking at it objectively, I, I, you know, it's there's a Capra-esque aspect to this movie, and it it smacks of a lot of films that were made in the 40s, 50s. <coughs> Excuse me. In the, it, during that period, the major studios had these wonderful character actors that were under contract, uh, many of whom would have played that guy with James Stewart. And when I read the script, I saw that, and I said, this is, this is an amalgam of all of those great old character guys and it's uh, again I, I'm, a, I'm a, a Brooklyn Jewish guy and, and I was very aware that this guy has to be a Midwestern or wherever wasp character he has to be Jim Carrey's dad 
I could never be Jim Carrey's dad in life, actually. And yet Jim kept saying, you remind me so much of my father. And, uh, and Jim and I, I mean, I, I, he felt like my son. I don't have a son, I have two daughters. But I connected in a lot of ways with Jim and we had fun doing it. We had a good time and, and there is a dignity to the, this character. And there is a, a huge desire and belief that's above. It's what makes the entire town believe and ultimately Jim Carrey, his character to believe. So it, 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 it's really like a, a battering ram of a certain kind and yet it has to be done uh, with dignity. I can't say it any other way. But it, it was an interesting challenge actually and not an easy one. Uh, the trick is always to make something look seamless but I mean I was aware of, of problems and yet I understood almost intuitively what was needed from the get-go. Great, thank you. Um, Steve Pandas. Hi, Mr. Lando. Um, I just wanted to ask you over your career, um, if you could tell one thing to a lesser experienced actors, some pitfalls they fell into, things they did they, they shouldn't have done, things that the, through your experience you realize they shouldn't have done. If you could say one or two things, what would you tell them? What have you seen as the biggest pitfall, the most common one, I guess, is my question, that you've seen over the years in lesser experienced actors on the set? I'm a big believer in taking one step at a time. In life, work, staying in the moment, um, in life, in work. Um, you know, believing your own publicity or your own reviews, deadly. Um, thinking, you know, it's important that you continue to think of yourself as a journeyman actor, as a working actor. Never get past that, no matter how, it's very easy for young kids who, you know, suddenly, bingo, they get a series, bingo, it hits, bingo, they're on the cover of every magazine and not easy. A lot of stuff is coming their way very fast and I've always noticed over the, over the years, temperament never comes out of security. Temper tantrums never come out of security, come out of insecurity. People who are maybe afraid of that day's work and suddenly throw all kinds of stuff this way and that way because they're not ready for that, and, but they're in a place uh, expectation, I go back to that word again, you know. Each day you have work to do and don't get ahead of yourself. Deal with it, find a way to do it. It's not about being comfortable either, it's about licking it. You know, a lot of times you see actors, actors will come on and, and they'll rewrite something because they had a problem with it. Uh, I'm not a big believer in that and I've worked on some awfully written television scripts. <laughs> I mean, but I, I think it's a challenge for me to say the words as written and make it work. A real challenge. When I was working with Woody in Crimes and Misdemeanors, I never changed a word, ever. 
I never added an uh, a bu, a nun. And Woody kept saying, uh, uh, that was a hard scene. And I'd say, yeah. He'd say, you, you didn't seem to have a problem with it. Well, I said, you know, it's not. He says, I write in a very literary way. You know, it's not real talk. I said, I know. He said, but it's like water off of a duck for you. I said, well, not really. I had to work my ass off to, <laughs> to, to I mean, it, it, you know, he said, it's not, doesn't, you know, I, I write, it's not real talk. I said, I know. <laughs> he said, but you didn't change anything. I said, why would I? It's good writing. He said, and I didn't ask you to change anything. I said, why would you? He said, well, sometimes he says, you know, when a scene isn't working, I, I, I tell, I said, you know, how, how would you say it? Or what if you, you know, but, and about the third or fourth time he said that to me, and I said to him, I said, you know, why would I rewrite a Woody Allen script? I said, if this was 1600 and I was at the Globe Theater, <laughs> I'd say, uh, and Willie was out there, he'd say, hey, Bill, <laughs> Bill Shakespeare, you know this to be or not to be speech, I think it sucks. Can, uh, would you mind if I play around with it a little bit? <laughs> Whatever makes me comfortable, thanks, thanks. Uh, should I or shouldn't I? <laughs> anyway, it's not about being comfortable. It's not about being comfortable. It's about finding a way to do it. That's the best way to do it. Not the easiest way or the most comfortable way to do it. And the willingness to fall on your face. <coughs> you know, if you try to be bad, it's hard to be bad. If you take chances and really believe in that leap, it's hard to be bad. If you try to be good, it's easy to be bad. <laughs> You'd be surprised, you know. I mean, actors' arrogance, a certain kind of audacity, and trust. Trust, hey, if you don't think you're a good actor, don't do it. That's, you know, that sort of honesty with yourself. Say, so, you know, I really don't think I'm really that good. Well, hey, it's hard enough if you think you're great. <laughs> No, I mean that. So be honest. And if you think you're talented and maybe not working well at the moment, take a class. I'm not a big believer in co-reading classes. I'm not a big believer in casting directors holding co-reading classes. I don't believe in that a whole lot. I don't believe in instant, you know, Bandini. Uh, I believe in, in, in really developing your instrument and learning your craft and being able to get there fast. I mean, I'm a method actor. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a product of Lee Strasberg's. I, but I don't need more than 15 or 20 seconds to get anywhere. It's all about the exercise of this and that are all designed not to bother people with the fact that I'm a method actor. No, no one needs to know that I am a system actor, because Stanislavski never used the word method. It's badly translated. I'm a system actor. Stanislavski system. Anyway. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, you know, you want this, you want that? Okay, give me a second. Okay, let's go. Get there, get there. And all of the training is about, you know, if I was a, a, con a concert piano player, and I was playing mm, uh, well, let's say Bach because of the intricacy. Uh, and I was having trouble with a section. I would and I, you know every time I started getting to that section, I would say, "Whoops, well, 
here goes. I would work my ass off on that section so that I didn't have that problem anymore. That's what scales are for. That's what this is for. That's what that's for. It's not, that's when people say sense memory exercises, effective memory exercises, these kind of exercises, physical exercises, animal exercises. All of that is designed to get you, your instrument to become quick, facile, available, willing to respond. And that's what it's about. It's not about mystery. It's about things that are, allow your senses, again, you know, I mean, things we see, hear, touch, taste, and smell are the things that, without that, we'd be a blob of protoplasm. I mean, there's nobody on the other end of the telephone. Yeah, hello, yeah. Excuse me. When? No kidding. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, but I, I can't do it right now. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I promise I will. Yeah, in about an hour. About an hour? Yeah. I can't talk right now. I'm, I'm actually, there's a lot of people here and I, <laughs> yeah, I, I promise I will. Yes. <laughs> God. I'll explain later. <laughs> okay. Bye. I'm so sorry. <laughs>that's what acting's about. This nothing is real. The realities don't exist. You're in an air-conditioned stage or theater and you, Tennessee Williams tells you it's 125 degrees in New Orleans. Now, that's not, it's hot, let's get on with it. No, that's like that sensuality, that, that heat, the sweat dripping down arms and bodies and stuff and yeah, exactly the, it's the sensuality slash sexuality that heat is a character in the play you can't do Williams without it it permeates everything it ain't hot <laughs> but you have to believe it is and function as if it is and behave in the way that it is, or else you can't do the part. <laughs> you can't do the part. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> this has been such an interesting evening because not only did we get to learn more about you and your career, but we got a real sense of the pragmatic principles and fundamentals of, of acting that uh, we don't often get to hear in, in these evenings. That sometimes it just becomes a recitation of, of someone's career. And we got to see tonight in you such a commitment and such an artist and the artist's approach and such a teacher. And it was great to have you here this evening. I well, hope you'll come back and see us again. Thank you so much.